the whole test is can you stop yourself from following your desires and succumbing to your base nature like the animals and then glorify Allah and worship him like the angels and once you do that you ascend even beyond the angels which is why the human being is actually can can not is can be more virtuous than even the angels themselves and you see that when Allah creates Adam Allah tells the angels bow down to him now Adam is put in Jannah and this is the same Jannah that we're talking about here so he actually lived there it's a real place it's not something you imagine it's not something it's, it actually exists and it is there waiting for us right now now Adam was in Jannah and he was with his wife Hawa or Eve um, who can tell you where Eve is buried? Hawa is, is said to be buried. Does anyone know? Okay, has anyone been to Saudi Arabia? Right. Who can tell me some of the cities in Saudi Arabia? Don't, don't give me the obvious. It's not Mecca Medina. Or other, other, other cities. Riyadh. Riyadh, no? Does he say Jeddah? Khabar. Yeah, Khabar and, and Jeddah as well. So, Jeddah, who knows what Jeddah means in Arabic? Jeddah means uh, grandmother. So, it was believed. That our grandmother, it is believed our grandmother, our Jeddah, is actually buried in, in Jeddah, in that city. And Allah knows this. Anyway, uh, so Allah is Hawa and Adam, and they are in paradise. And then they are given rules. They are given rules. Just one rule. What's the rule? Who can tell me? Don't eat from the, from the tree. But they do. And they make that mistake. And then they are cast down. There's actually a discussion, a scholarly discussion whether they were in the actual Jannah or a different version of it. But the majority of scholars say they were in the actual Jannah and that seems to be what the Quran suggests. Um, so then their whole story, Adam and Hawa, and their children, including us, is to find our way back to Jannah. And this is why Allah sent us messengers. And this is what our journey is all about. To get back to our final abode, one of the names of Jannah is Darul Salam, the abode of peace, the place of peace. Darul Khul, the place of eternity. Darul Hayawan, the place of life, or the home of life. It's also called Jannah or Adani, right? The Garden of Eden. It's called um, Jannah al Ma'wa, which is the Jannah of Al Ma'wa, which is your final home. Where Allah makes among those that go there. So, the Prophet spoke a lot about the Jannah, and Allah speaks about Allah in the Quran about Jannah. And there's a reason for that. Because as human beings, we are motivated in different ways. Some of us are motivated through fear. And this is why you worship Allah, because you don't want to end up being among those of the hellfire. And some people are motivated by, by uh, Jannah. They worship Allah because they want to go to this amazing place. In any case, Allah says in the Quran, Rush and hasten to the forgiveness of your Lord. It's vast as it's like the heavens and the earth. It has already been prepared. It has already been prepared. For those who have taqwa, for those who are pious. So, to get there, you need to have piety. Now, this lecture isn't necessarily about how to get there. I'm sure there will be lectures about how to worship and how to stay away from sin. This is how you get there. I want to talk more about the actual Jannah. Now I want you to imagine, um, if someone were to tell you, describe for me the most amazing place you would want to live on Earth. If you Google the most amazing places to live, the most amazing place on this Earth, and the best homes, they all have similar qualities. Houses are big, usually close to a beach, Right, um, water, either an ocean or a river, greenery. Isn't that what we imagine? Isn't that what you want? Now, why do you like that? Why do all of human beings enjoy that type of scenery? Allah created us that way. It's what we gravitate it's what we enjoy. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Jannah that way as well. But the difference is a difference that cannot be imagined. Were there people that actually went to Jannah? Yes. The Prophet actually saw Jannah. And you can imagine the Prophet uh, he actually walked in Jannah and he described it. And it was difficult for him to describe because it is so different from what we know 
that every description that you will find, it is just to get it as close as possible for you to understand, but you have to keep one rule in mind. Everything you hear about paradise, literally, everything you hear about paradise, whatever you imagine is better. And whatever you imagine is not even close to it. But it's just to, to, to uh, I mean, you, you have to be told something. So the Prophet ﷺ, and described Jannah. First, he described some people that he saw there. Now, we all know how many companions are promised paradise. Who can tell you? Ten. Ten. Actually, you know, that's a, that's a very common uh, misconception people have. No. Most of the companions are promised paradise. Right? And those ten that you always hear about, it's actually ten that were promised paradise in one sitting. So the Prophet was sitting and said, you're going to Jannah, you're going to Jannah, you're going to Jannah. Those ten are mentioned together, but there were so many more. The Prophet said about Romaisa, who was a companion, a female companion of Prophet He said, I saw her in Jannah. The Prophet said about uh, his daughter Fatima, you are the, uh, the leader of all women folk in Jannah. So his daughter is going to Jannah. And he told her, don't worry, when he passed away, she was very sad. By the way, the Prophet's life, if you remove him being a prophet, it's actually a very tragic life. If you remove the ass of the Prophet being a prophet, it's a very tragic life. The Prophet Sallallahu was born as an orphan, so he never knew his father. His mother died at the age of six, his grandfather at the age of eight, and then he is raised as an orphan by his uncle, and he gets married, and all of his children die before him. Literally, all of his children die before him, except for Fatima. So Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi actually saw a lot of tragedy. And even Fatima, uh, this is why, uh, when, when, uh, when the Prophet had his baby Ibrahim in his hands. By the way, I am known to go on tangents. I apologize. I, I, I didn't do that. It's just how my brain works. I'll try to stay on topic. <laughs> um, but when the Prophet was holding his baby, his baby Ibrahim, and this is the last child that actually died before he passed away, he cried. He cried so much that the Sahaba were surprised because the Prophet had quite a big beard and his whole beard became wet. And, and he said, oh, my heart is hurting. And my eyes have tears, but I will never say it except that which pleases Allah. And this is how we should deal with grief, by the way. When you're dealing with grief, your heart hurts, you'll cry, but you'll never say anything that's except pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, accepting the decree of Allah. So then, as his death came close, uh, interesting enough, prophets, when they die, they're given a choice to stay alive or die. Every prophet was given the choice. We don't have a choice. When the angel of death comes walking, you're gone. But prophets, Allah would give them the choice. This is why when, when the angel of death came to Prophet Ibrahim, the Prophet Musa, uh, uh, he didn't recognize him at first, and he hit him, because he used to come in human form. And then the angel comes back and tells Musa, listen, Allah is telling you to touch that, um, touch the, um, the back of a, of, a, of a cow or a bull. And every single hair you touch, you'll get another year of life. That's a lot of years, isn't it? But then Musa said, in the end, will I not die? Yes, you will. He said, I'm ready to go now. So they were given the choice. And Prophet Muhammad was given the choice as well. And they were always given the choice. And this is why the Prophet said to his companions, uh, he gave a sermon, he sat, he sat on his bin bar, he gave a sermon and said to them, among Allah's slaves was a person, and this is quite cryptic, he said, among Allah's slaves was a person who was given a choice between two things, and he chose their better. And everyone was like, yeah, that's quite random. Okay, someone was given a choice and he chose what's better. But Abu Bakr started crying. Abu Bakr and he was like, why, is, why are you crying? But he, he understood what the Prophet meant. He meant that he was given the choice between living and dying, and he chose to die. Because for him, dying was better, because he would move on to a better world, he would move on to Jannah. And when he, then he gets sick, and his daughter comes to him, and she's really her, her father is dying, her beloved father, her prophet. And he says, does it not make you happy that you will join me in six months? And this is why uh, as she was crying. And then when he told her that, she became happy. When he told her she's going to die in six months, she became happy. And Aisha asked her, I saw you smiling. And she said, yeah, the Prophet told you something between me and him. The point is, uh, and then she would tell her um, that um, they were looking forward to dying because they know they were going to Jannah. They know they were going to be reunited. They knew that they were going to a place the Prophet has described for them and talked about. The Prophet, when he was shown paradise, 
he saw it. He said, I saw a man so beautiful, I cannot describe it. He said, its, it, it's, uh, its palaces were gold and silver. He said, I saw a huge, huge, beautiful home. And I said, I saw some woman there. And I tried to go in, but then I was told not to. And I was told, this is where Umar would live. And he said, I heard footsteps. And I was told, who's that? And he told me, it's Bilal. And the Prophet said them, this is a real place he saw. So when he came back and he's telling the people, like, work really hard to get there. Work really hard to get there. The Prophet said in the hadith, every single person has a place in Jannah. But they just have to work to get there. Everyone has an address. All of us in our place, but we have to put the work in. We have to put the work in. And Allah talks about when we find the Jannah. So before that, you have the judgment, you have the resurrection. And when we are resurrected, you, we're going to go through some hardship. Who can tell me how long the day of judgment is? Have you guys heard how long the day of judgment is? What have you guys heard? Khamsina al Fasana. I say that in English? 50,000 years. Right? How is that possible? But the Prophet said in Hadith, for the believer, it's like between the Asr and Marib. For the believer, between Ashiyat and Muduha. May Allah make us among those that die as believers. So, there are tests that will happen. And the deal of judgment isn't difficult. But the Prophet gave us advice. He said, come find me at my pond. On the day of judgment, there is a place where people will drink from. It's a pond, a huge pond of water. And the Prophet said that every Prophet has one. And he said, mine is so big, it is between sun, as big as between sun and a city Iraq. It's huge. And he said, come find me there. I will be there on my pulpit. And there will be cups there for the people to drink from. He said, when you drink from it, you'll never get thirsty again. Now remember, you're not in Jannah yet. But what are you drinking? You're drinking from the river that was given as a gift to the Prophet, Al-Kawthar. And the, Allah said in the Quran, Inna a'tayna kal kawthar. We have given you a kawthar. Interesting story about that. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was with his companions one day, and, and he, he put his head down like this to close his eyes. And he got up and he smiled. And he said, Ya Rasulullah, what happened? And he said, Qad unzila alayhi suratun. A chapter was revealed upon me, and he read, Inna a'tayna kal kawthar. Indeed, we have given you a kawthar. So this is a, is a river owned by the Prophet and his and the pond that the people drink from, so that how on their judgment the believers will drink from, that water is coming from the Kothar. Anyway, once we get to Jannah, inshallah we all will. Um, the, the gates of paradise will not open for anyone. People are waiting, it's time to go in. And the angel will be the one who is the guardian of the gates, we're not allowed to open for anyone. And the people are waiting. And he said, I've been ordered to open it only for one person, and that's Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then the gates of paradise are open. And its fragrance can be smelled from such a long distance. But people are so eager to go in. And angels come out, saying to the people, Salamun alaykum bima sabartum. Peace upon you, for you have patience. You have patience when you woke up for Fajr. You have patience when you wore the hijab. You have patience when you fast in Ramadan. Peace upon you. Salamun alaykum ya sabatum. Salamun alaykum dittum fadkhuluha khalideen. Peace upon you. You are good. Enter it and you will live in there forever. Hada yomukum. Today is your day that you are promised. So you have all these angels giving people that tidings. And people are wanting to enter Jannah. And what's interesting is that the Prophet is the first person to his to step into Jannah. But a woman, Sahih al is a woman that almost enters before him. And the, the Prophet said, who is this woman? And the Prophet said, it is a, he says, it is a woman who, her husband died, she was a single mother, and she struggled raising her children, while she did her best, and she raised them properly. And the Prophet said, the Tuzahimuni fi duhuli Jannah. She almost beats me into Jannah. Again, this is an encouragement for people that the widows of people that and, and, and they are struggling raising their children and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevates their statuses. Once Jannah is entered, what happens? Allah says, 
Quran and Firuzi Nabi Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam we removed any enmity or anger from their hearts people are love for each other there's no hatred, there's no anger, there's no worries Allah mentions that once Jannah is entered that everyone will know where they're going you already know where you live and the rest of your life starts when people remember what happened in this world that's the first thing they'll talk about actually remember when did this, remember when did that they will inquire about each other have you seen this person, have you seen that person trying to find each other, trying to find their families but Jannah has levels Jannah has levels the highest level the Prophet was created that this is why the Prophet said in a hadith if you want to ask Allah for advice ask him for Firdaus Firdaus al-A'la it is the highest place in Jannah. It is the middle of Jannah. It is the best place to be. It's where the Prophet Sallallahu is. Now not everyone will be in Jannah if you're those. But that's okay, you can visit. The Prophet said that Jannah is levels. And every level will look at the level above them like we look at the stars. Like we look at the stars. And your station and level will be determined by how much you worship and how much of a, of a righteous person you were. But who cares once you're in Jannah, right? Really, really. The point is to get to Jannah. Yes, the Prophet is telling us, and this is beautiful because the Prophet is telling us, aim high, aim for free those. But Ahmed bin Hanbal, a great scholar one time, his son got worried about him. He said, my father, you're praying every night. You barely sleep. You're always fasting. Why don't you take a break? Why don't you rest? And he said, my son, I want to rest. And I will relax when I see my two feet in Jannah. That's when I will relax. There were actual people that walked this earth that were not prophets that were going to Jannah. Uh, example would be the the woman from from uh, the Prophet said that a woman came to him one time, and the Sahaba described her. She, she said they said a uh, so that she was a black woman who was sick, she had an illness. Also illness, she would faint. A lot of people say it was like something along the lines of epilepsy. So she, she came to the Prophet and said, I believe you're a believing woman. Say, Ya Rasulullah, make the act for me to get better. And by the way, the Prophet used to do it quite often. The Prophet said one of the benefits the Sahaba had was, you're sick, you just go to the Prophet. And the Prophet said, I can, I can make the act for you and you'll get better immediately. Or have patience when you go to Jannah. Have patience when you go to Jannah. She says, I'm going to think about it. She went away, she thought about it, she came back, I said, Allah, I'd rather keep, I'd rather stay in and ensure myself a spot in Jannah. But can you make the act for me that when I do faint, I don't get uncovered? Because her clothing, she would get uncovered and she was uncomfortable with that. So, Allah, I need Make dua for me so that I don't get uncovered. Prophet made dua for So from that on, whenever she fell or she fainted, she would fall in a way where her clothes she would always be covered. She lived for a long time. Abdullah bin Abbas, his companion, he he used to say to the people that didn't meet the Prophet. So he used to say to the Tabi'in, "Shall I show you guys a woman who's in Jannah? Who's going to Jannah? Like, yeah, she's that woman over there. Yeah." She's going to Jannah. She, he would tell them this story. Um, and there were many examples of that. One time, a verse got revealed in the Quran. Allah said, uh, uh, That you're not allowed to raise your voice over the Prophet's voice. So, one of the things that people did was they would come outside the Prophet's home, Oh, Prophet of Allah, and they would be very loud. And Allah prohibited that. They have to be respectful when you're with the Prophet. So there was one companion whose voice was just really loud. And he thought this verse was about him. And he became depressed. And he stayed at home. And he wouldn't come out. He said, listen, uh, every time I speak, I speak over the Prophet. So and I don't want to be among those that will be punished. And the Prophet said, call him and tell him he's actually going to be from Jannah. So there were a lot of companions that were told that they were from Jannah. And not to mention the four Khalifs, right? Now, although they were among the ten of Prophet's paradise, but individually, one time, uh, a, a companion uh, called Abu Musa Al-Ash'ari. Abu Musa Al-Ash'ari, uh, Musa Al-Ash'ari is, um, he had a very beautiful voice, a very beautiful voice. The Prophet said that he, he had someone like the voice of Prophet Dawood, who would read 
would read uh, his uh, his zabur in a way when he did, the birds would all come and listen. You know, we listen to birds, and they will listen to the Lord Alayhi Salam. And Musa one time was reading the Quran, and the Prophet loved his voice so much, and he said to him, Allah laqad ataka Allah mizmaara min mazamiri ala ta'ud. And he said, if I knew, I would have read even more beautifully. So Abu Musa one day said, you know what? All day I'm going to spend with the Prophet. But one thing we don't understand is that we take the companions with the Prophet 24-7. They have lives, they have children, they have work. So they weren't, they weren't able to spend the whole day with the Prophet. Which is why you'd find some companions saying, they should dedicate a, a day to the Prophet. This is why you would have the female Sahaba say to the Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, you have to give us private lessons because we don't have enough access to you. And this is what would happen. Even Umar al-Khattab, anhu, he had a neighbor, and they would take turns. So one day, one of them would work, and the other would be with the Prophet, and then they would swap. And he would tell them about any information that they missed or any verse that came down, because they weren't able to spend their whole day with the Prophet sallallahu uh, alayhi Which is why one, one day, um, this Sahabi and Umar were neighbors. He comes knocking on his door, bang, 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 bang. And Umar opens the door. Why are you back so soon? What's going on? Did, did the Romans invade us? Right? And this shows you that the Muslims were very heightened and they were always on high alert because and they didn't know it's even worse. What could be worse? I think the Prophet divorced all of his wives. And I know this is a tangent. And Omar, guess who's married to the Prophet's daughter? He, and he comes. And this was when the Prophet said he had somewhat of a dispute with all of his wives because they asked for more money and more income. And the Prophet wasn't about that life. The Prophet wasn't about that life. And it hurt him that they became more interested in dunya. So he took a whole break from them for a month. A full month, he just was isolated, he was with himself. And Umar, he goes to his daughter and he's like, he tells her, what's going on? No, we did, we asked the Prophet. Another time she told him that she had to shit. Another, another time, I'm sorry, this is a tangent, but I, I, I rather finish this point. Because uh, Umar had an interesting relationship with his daughter, who was married to the Prophet and then Hafsa. Um, Umar's wife talks back to him in a way that he found a bit rude, like, whoa, what's going on? Right? And what's interesting is the women from Mecca were a lot more, um, I should say, subservient than the women in Medina who were a lot more um, fierce. And the Sahaba was a culture shock to them. Like, whoa, what's wrong with these Medina women? And actually, Umar says that to the Prophet I said that one time, he says, like, yeah, so a lot of these, Medina has a different culture than us, right? And this shows you that a lot of these things, they go back to culture, right? Some uh, men and women are not always the same wherever you go in the world, right? And it's all cultural. There's no right or wrong there. So uh, then Umar so the, uh, so told his wife, like, what's going on? You, you're speaking to me very used to it. He said, what do you mean? Everyone, you're not, you're not, you're not special. Your own daughter speaks like this to the Prophet. Like what? And you runs to to Hafsa. Like Hafsa, the Prophet. Have you been arguing with the Prophet? But the, what what's missing here is, although Hafsa, the Prophet, is the Prophet, he's also a husband, and husband and wives always, right? They have that normal relationship. But tomorrow that's a bit because he to him he's just a Prophet. So, and then he says, and he said something interesting to her. He said, "Listen, you can't do this. Do you think you're Aisha? Like, <laughs> like, you can't you can't do this." Um, anyway, so he sees what's going on, and Umar Khattab goes to the Prophet and he asks him, and this is what he tells him, you know, these women are different. There's a point I was trying to get at, um, and to backtrace, uh, this happens to me quite often, I go on a tangent, but I was talking about how the Sahaba were not able to spend a lot of time with the Prophet the way they wanted, hence why Umar had to find out from another party what happened, right? So Abu Musa Ashari decided one day, I'm going to spend time with the Prophet, a full day, I'm going to spend the day. So he dedicated the whole day to the Prophet and going to be with him. So he said he saw the Prophet, and the Prophet was relaxing in a in a, a garden, had a little pond of water, and he was sitting there, the Prophet had his feet in the water, and he was relaxing. And he said, I'm going to stand at the gate just to kind of guard the Prophet. The Prophet says to him, Abu Musa, come here. The first person that walks in, tell them to go to Jannah. The first person that walks in, I'm going to Jannah. And he said, who is it going to be? And he sees Abu Bakr walks in, he says, Abu Bakr, the Prophet told me you're from the people of Jannah. And Abu Bakr praises Allah and sits next to the Prophet. And says, the second person that walked in or is also in the people of Jannah. And Umar al-Khattab walks in. And then he said, the third person that walks in 
It's not my agenda, but they will be tested before they die. They will be tested before they die. Then Uthman walked in and said, Uthman, the Prophet's telling me that you have my agenda, but you will be tested before you die. And he said, um, I trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Fourth, what I'm trying to say is these people who promised paradise while they were on this earth. So it's not something that is impossible. But what, what I want you guys to do is look into their stories, into their worship, their belief, their faith, their conviction, how much they read the Quran, how much they believed in Allah, how much they did for Islam, how much charity they gave. That will give an understanding of why they're in Jannah. Let's go back to Jannah, inshallah. And we were talking about it already. Um, so, there are some beautiful hadith I mentioned. For example, what the people of Jannah will eat. They mentioned that they will drink and they, they will eat. And none of it, eating and drinking's consequences will happen. People don't need to use the toilet in Jannah. People don't get sick. People don't get angry. People don't get tired. None of, none of the deficiencies you have on this earth is present in paradise. It's all removed. You literally live a perfect life. And it is, we can talk about the palaces, we can talk about how the beauty, how the Prophet described the first group that would enter Jannah, they will, their face will be as bright as a full moon. We can talk about how Allah described the women in Jannah and how beautiful they are. Or how the women that are created in Jannah are not comparable to those who lived on earth and worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And how um, the... But what I really like to talk about is what Allah says in the Quran. And this verse, it's, it's really amazing because Allah says, لَهُمْ فِيهَا مَا يَشَاءُ They will give in Jannah whatever they want. And I want you to just think about it for a second. Literally, anything you want, you'll get in Jannah. لَهُمْ فِيهَا مَا يَشَاءُ وَلَدَيْنَا مَتِيدًا I will give them next Jannah, Allah says. The Prophet described for us the last person that will enter Jannah. So the last person that will enter Jannah will be someone that committed a lot of sin and deserved to go to the hellfire. They were punished for it, but after a while they are removed from it because anyone, anyone who had faith in their heart will end up in Jannah. No matter how many things you've done, if you had la ilaha illallah in your heart, you will enter Jannah. Because of Allah's mercy and because of our Prophet's intercession, because our Prophet loved us. He loved us so much that he had stayed up at night praying for us. He loved us so much that he would constantly make the dua for us. And he mentioned that every Prophet has a very special dua, but he said, I didn't use mine, I kept it for my Ummah. And on the Day of Judgment, when the Prophet will speak to Allah, he will he will, he will prostrate under Allah's throne and he will praise Allah and he will call upon Allah and Allah will say, Oh Muhammad, raise your head. Raise your head. Irfar asak. Is'al. Du'ata. Ask me, I will give you. And all of Muhammad will say, Oh Allah, my Ummah, my Ummah, my nation, my nation. And then Allah will say, Anyone of your nation that believes in you and the righteous actions will go to them. It's Oh Allah, even those that just believed. He keeps asking until he says, Oh Allah. If any of them ever said La ilaha illallah, please give them Jannah. So Allah accepts it from you. The last person that will enter into Jannah will make dua from the midst of hellfire. Now you have to understand, someone like that wasn't someone that lived in ordinary life. He must have been a very simple person. But he said, Oh Allah, please, I don't even want to go to Jannah. I just want to leave this place. And Allah says, Okay, and Allah leaves it, takes him out. And then he will be able to smell the fragrance of Jannah and he will say, Oh Allah, can I just get near it? And Allah will say, Have you not told me that you want to ask me anything else? Just, oh Allah, just, I want to just get near to this place. And he will hear, he get near it, and then he will hear the laughter and the joy. And he will say, Oh Allah, can I stand at the door, at the gates? And Allah will say, Have you not asked me, do you not want to say anything else? And then he will stand at the gate. And then finally, Allah tells him, Go inside. And he will say, Oh Allah, you're mocking me. Can I really go in? And so Allah says, Go inside. And he goes inside. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells him, This is the whole point of this. The concept of getting whatever you want. Allah will tell him this five word, Tamanni. Tamanni. You know what Tamanni means? It means wish. If 
ويتمنى ويتمنى يو ويش فور سمثينغ اند ذن سمثينغ ايلس اند ذن سمثينغ ايلس اند ذن سمثينغ ايلس انتي كان ثينك اوف انيثينغ ايلس انيمور ان اذر ويرز هي ليتشلي كان نوت ثينك اوف انيثينغ ايلس هي وونتس اي وونت يو تو ايماجين ذات ان ايماجين سمون تول يو ذات جست ويش تو ويش فور تو ويش فور تو اول دو لايك يو نو اي ثينك اي ايفر ثينك اي ايفر وونتد فايد اكيره الله باشياء يريدها ولكن نسيها Not Allah will remind you of things he actually wanted, but he completely forgot about. He didn't want this as well. Oh, yeah, this as well. Yeah. And this is the person who has the least in Jannah. Who has the least in Jannah. And then finally, Allah will say, You have this and ten times more. So, among the greatest blessings of Jannah is the fact that you can get whatever you want. And then. There are also the things Allah established in Jannah. Every Friday, the people of Jannah will go out. Every Friday, they go out. And they will go to a, a, a souk, like a marketplace. And when they do, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send a wind from the north that will completely change their clothing and their appearances to something that is even better. And they'll come home and they can be very recognizable and this happened to the people they left at home as well and they will say you look even more beautiful you look even more handsome you look even more better and the blessings in Jannah keep on increasing now the people are eating and enjoying they're all the same age or they're all at that age of 33 33 there's one hadith that the mentions that they will be the age of Isa so the same thing Isa will be at 33 or died not died, ascended at 33. Um, they will um, never get sick, they will never die, they will never tire. They will be in eternal bliss. And everything they ever wanted, they will get. Now there's one thing, or two things actually, two things that are part of Jannah that people will appreciate more than everything else we talk about. One of them is seeing Allah, seeing Allah, seeing the Creator, our Creator. One of the things that a lot of times we miss in our lives is feeling like we have a personal relationship with your Creator. And this is something that is really missing, right? Whenever you're in trouble, whenever you're struggling, whenever you're sick, whenever you need something, when you call upon Allah, you have to understand that He is your Allah. He is your creator. He is your caretaker. He loves you. He wants good for you. And we tend to sometimes see it as a very impersonal relationship. And this is why I, why I feel like it's missing in a lot of our lives is that we relegated our relationship with Allah as in do this, do this, do this. That's not the case. Your relationship with Allah should be one that's built upon love. You should love Allah. And Allah says in the Quran about, about the people, you should pull you should pull out. They love him and he loves them. Allah when he speaks of the companion, he says, Radiallahu anhum wa radhuan. They were pleased with Allah and Allah was pleased with them. It's a relationship with that it has a give and a take. And you need to build a relationship with Allah like that. You need to be feel feel comfortable enough with your creator that when you sin you go back to Allah. And when you need you ask him. And you complain to Allah. You complain to Allah. Right? Our dua is not always official. No, it doesn't have to be. Look at Yaqub alayhi salam. He misses his son, who he hasn't seen for years. He feels that his other son has betrayed him. He, he's been crying so much that he can't see anymore. He's in distress. And what does he say? إِنَّمَا أَشْكُوا وَبَثِّي إِنَ اللَّهِ رُزْنِي إِلَى اللَّهِ إِنَّمَا أَشْكُوا وَبَثِّي رُزْنِي إِلَى اللَّهِ I complain my sorrow and my sadness to you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is how you should be. Our Prophet whenever something would trouble him, he would pray. And that prayer wasn't a chore, it is something he found comfort in. Musa alayhi salam, and this is again, it shows you that you, you need to start changing our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to one where we yearn for Allah, where we appreciate Allah, we understand what he did for us. Because Allah, I think about this, right? Write a piece of paper, try to take a piece of paper and try to write down all the good things in your life. And there are things you won't even forget. You can see, you can walk, right? you have a family, uh, you're in uni, 
right? You have, you know, I don't know, a whole thousand and one things that you can think of, right? Genuinely being thankful. And, and um, Musa alayhi salam, he told by Allah, come to the Mount of Tor, and I'm going to give you the Torah, right? He takes 70 of his men with him, and they're climbing the mountain, and he's about to receive revelation, he's about to receive the Torah. But as they are climbing, he is rushing. He's rushing, and they see from behind him. And he gets to the top, and it's just him. And Allah says, وَمَا عَجَلَكَ عَنْ قَوْمِكَ يَا مُوسَى What made you rush, O Musa? And he said, قَالَ هُمْ أُولَيْا قَلَيْا Oh, Allah, they're coming. وَعَجِلْتُ I rushed. إِلَيْكَ to you, إِثَارَ اللَّهُ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ He pleased me. I rushed to you, Allah, so that you could please me. That feeling that you, you want to please Allah, that you trust Allah, that you love Allah, this was present in all of the prophets. And it is, it is that feeling that is missing from a lot of our lives and we relegate our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to one where we just gotta do what we gotta do and that's it. And this is something that we don't have to rectify. So, what are the two greatest blessings in them? One is that the fact that Allah will be pleased with them. Uh, Allah will say to the people of Jannah, Is there anything else you want? And they will say, Oh Allah, Alam Tafir Dhurubana, have you forgiven our sins? Have you not brightened our faces? Have you not made Jannah a home for us? And they will mention all the things they've been given. What could we possibly, possibly ask for after all of this? And then Allah says to them, I am pleased with you and I will never be angry with you. Then the Prophet said that, that feeling of Allah being pleased with you, you, you who sinned, you who made errors, you who chose your own desires of Allah so many times, you and me, for Allah to be pleased with us is a greater blessing than everything in general. In another narration, the Prophet ﷺ said that Allah will say to them when he asked them, are you happy with everything that you've gotten in Jannah? They will say, yes, O Allah. And then Allah will tell them there is one more thing left. And Allah will remove the veil between him and his creation. And they will look up and they will see the Creator. And that moment, nothing else will matter. And the Prophet used to say, Oh Allah, I ask you. In a long dua, he would say, Oh Allah, I ask you, a show O ilahi ghaib. Oh Allah, give me an eagerness to want to meet you. So he would say, Oh Allah, grant me an eagerness to want to meet you. And the sweetness of looking at your beautiful face or noble face. So the Prophet would pray to Allah for those two things, wanting to meet Allah and wanting to see Allah. Seeing Allah and Allah being pleased with you is considered to be the greatest blessing of Jannah, which is why Allah says in the Quran, لِلَّذِينَ أَحْسَنُوا Those who do good, those who are righteous, who pray, who fast, who, who do hayr, who give charity, لِلَّذِينَ أَحْسَنُوا The reward is Al-Husna, Paradise. وَزِيَادَةً And more. More, what does more mean? It means Allah being pleased with you and you getting to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Which is why Allah says in another verse of the Quran, after mentioning the reward of Jannah in the Jibin Tahtan and Ha'ar, that Allah said, وَيَدْوَارٌ مِنَ اللَّهِ أَكْبَرٌ And the pleasure of your reward is greater. For Allah to be pleased with you is greater than all the aforementioned things. So, Yes, Jannah is great. You can get whatever you want. You you wish for it. It has so many levels. You should strive to get to Firdaus al-A'la. You should strive to become as near to the Prophet as possible as well. This is why in your dua, don't say, Allah has to be Jannah. Say, Allah, I want the highest place in Jannah. And this is what the Prophet encourages to do, by the way. So aim high. Uh, in fact, the Prophet got upset one time when one of his companions didn't do that. And I might end up with that story. Um, it's 3 o'clock, I'll just end up, it's going to take about 5 or 6 minutes. One time, the Prophet said to them, 
uh, he went to the uh, he went to the desert. Uh, they were traveling, and a Bedouin man hosted them, gave them some food, he took care of them. The Prophet said to him, "If you ever come, you find yourself in Medina, come and find me, so I can reciprocate." Why? Because always, as a Muslim, you're supposed to reciprocate whenever something someone does good for you, which makes sense, right? So he said, "When you come to Medina, come to me." Lo and behold, after a while, this man he comes to Medina, he finds the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet says to him, "Listen, sit down. Ask me anything you want. Anything you want." He said, anything, anything. He yeah, asked Allah, I want a sheep. I can milk. And, okay, get this person on a sheep. What else do you want? Um, maybe an animal to ride, like a donkey or a camel. Okay, he got this. Anything else? He said, I could use someone to help around, maybe like a person to help around, a, a, like a, a, a khadim, a servant to, to help around with, with, the, with the livestock and everything. And the Prophet got upset and said, Wayak, that I just said that when we said that, I do say when we saw him, could you not have even, why are you like this? Could you not have been like the old lady of when we saw him? And I was like, Ya Rasulullah, who's the old lady of when we saw him? And then the Prophet tells a story that happened during the time of Prophet Musa. When Prophet Musa and the people of when we saw him, when they left Egypt after Fir'aun, they leave Egypt of course, they were supposed to find the promised land. But they kept on getting lost. They couldn't find their way. And it was strange. So Musa spoke to his people and they said to him, There was a promise made to Yusuf. Yusuf al said. Now, a lot of people don't know this part. Well, they do. But Yusuf is a ancestor of Musa. Because think about this. how did the Hebrews, the Hebrews, how did they end up in Egypt? How did they end up? Because we all know that they got oppressed by the Pharaoh, right? And they were not indigenous to those lands. We all know the story of Yusuf, how he, his brothers, they put him in a well, and then he's taken by a caravan, and then he lives in a, in a they, they came to Egypt. So Yusuf is in Egypt. Yusuf, the whole story of Yusuf alayhi salam, and the woman, and he goes to jail, and all that happens, and in the end he becomes a minister, and then his brothers come, and then finally, they are reunited, and he moves his father and his brother and his whole family to Egypt. Then they stay there, and they are foreigners. And then his brother, is, his oldest brother, was called Yehuda, which is where the word Yehud comes from. His father, Ya'ub, was called Israel, ben Israel. So literally, Yusuf and his brothers are the children of Israel. So this is why the Hebrews and the Israelites, they end up in Egypt, generation later, Musa is born. If the Pharaoh who doesn't like these foreigners, it, 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 they, they end up being enslaved. So that's how they end up. And then it's Musa that takes him away from this land. And one of the jobs of Musa is in other than to call towards Allah and to talk, call towards the worship of one God, was to save the Israelites. Which is why when, when Pharaoh asked him, Why did you come to me? He says to him, uh, And I bet that Israel, which enslaved Israel. So that's part of what he was doing. So they leave, right? The whole story between him and happened. they leave, and they can't find their way to the promised land. So he asks them, and they say, Yusuf, before he died, said, Prophet Yusuf, the ancestor said, one day you will leave this land, and when you do, ensure you take my body with you. So to the, to the promised land. Now, another thing that a lot of people know is prophets' bodies don't decay. Prophet's bodies don't decay. Any prophet, Prophet Ibrahim, Prophet Idris, Prophet Adam, if someone were to find them, they would be exactly like the way the way they were uh, when when, um, uh, when when they died. Their bodies don't decay. It's one of the uh, blessings that Allah gave them. Uh, and then Prophet Musa says, "Well, who knows where he's buried?" And they say, "One old lady." And this old lady, Prophet Musa says, "Okay, tell us where he's buried, so we can get him, and then we can find our way." She says, "No." Why? I want something in return. What do you want? I want to be in Jannah with you. I want to be in Jannah with you. It's Musa Ali Salaam. And then Musa was like, so he asks Allah, Allah tells him, tell him to tell you, Wallahi Jannah and Siyah Jannah. So all Prophet Muhammad is upset at the Bedouin man who's asking for goats and camels. Listen, you've got an opportunity where a Prophet is telling you, you're asking something, aim high, ask for Jannah. This was his point. So, uh, this is what the scholars say when we are making du'a, 
aim high. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant you the highest place of Jannah. Which is why one of the important companions, he got the opportunity when Rabbi Ra ibn Ka'b al he was a very poor companion, very poor companion. And uh, he used to spend most of his time, uh, he was homeless actually, he spent most of his time with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And one day the Prophet tells him, um, ask me anything. And he says, can I think about it? And he takes a few days and he comes back, Ya Rasulullah, I want to be with you, your neighbor, your friend in them. And the Prophet says, anything else? And he says, no. And he says, if that's the case, then do a lot of sujood. In other words, pray a lot. Uh, I'll get this sorted, will help me with a lot of prayer. And this is why we learn that if you want to end up in Jannah, you need to pray a lot. Pray your five daily prayers, pray a lot of sujood. Although the Prophet, when he said to him, ask me, he wanted to kind of help him out financially. And I and you find out, if you read Rabia's story, the Prophet will come to him again and say, after this incident where he says, I want Jannah, he will come to him and he will say, um, you should probably get married. And Rabia will say, I'm sort of too poor to get married. I'm not just only too poor, I love spending time with you, and I don't want to be busy. And uh, the Prophet says, okay, fine. And then after a while, the Prophet says to him, Again, Rabia, you should probably get married. So yeah, also Allah. If, even if I wanted to, I'm too poor, and also I lost spending time with you. And then Rabia is thinking to himself, Prophet keeps asking me. Next time he asks me, I'll tell him, how should I get married? What should I do? Rather than denying him outright. Um, it's a long story. I'm not sure if I should continue. Are you guys, uh, should we conclude there, inshallah? Um, Sorry? Well, okay, I'll finish this then. It's, 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 it's a short story. So how, what will happen? So then the, the, the third time the Prophet comes to him and says to him, Rabia, you should probably get married, or you should get married. He says, Ya Rasulullah, warn me. Tell me what to do. Like, are you serious? Yes. The Prophet said, go to that family, knock on the door, tell them I sent you, and that I want you to get engaged with the woman that lives there. So he says, he goes there, okay. I think about it, though. You can't say no to the Prophet, so he knocks on the door. They were an Ansar family, and he opened the door. It was going on. The, the Prophet sent me, and he told me that I should propose to the first woman that lives here. And the Prophet said, yeah, come on in. And right there, and then they said, we're going to make it happen. And so they, they accept the engagement. He comes back, and he sees the Prophet, he's sad. He's like, so why? Okay, so I'm supposed to marry this person, but I got no money to give her, no dowry. And nothing to do. And the Prophet said, Don't worry, we'll sort it out. He said, The Prophet that speaks to one of the elders of that Sahabi tribe and says, Get everyone to collect pieces of gold, small pieces of gold, and bring them together and give it, bring it to him. So they they collect some small pieces of gold, they come together, and it becomes a decent amount to listen, take that to the girl. So he takes the gold, he goes to her, and he gives her the gold. And they say, This is so much, this is brilliant. They, get, they are happy with it. He's like, eh, it's not that much. So he doesn't feel that he, that he got done enough. So he comes back and, and the Prophet sees and Rabbi Allah is still a bit down. What's going on? So he also, well, I, I, I've given them the dowry and they were happy with it, but I'm sure they were just saying that. But also, I'm supposed to do a wedding feast. How am I going to do that? The Prophet said, go to my house, speak to Aisha, and tell her that there's some food left. Get that food out. There was some some uh, some meat that could be cooked. So get whatever she has and bring it. And he does. And then he told another companion, bring a goat that can be salted for meat. And he puts it together and says, listen, tell, uh, we're going to slaughter the meat and, and make the meat and tell the woman folk to make the bread and we're going to have a feast. Simple as that. So the Prophet is really helping him. And they make this happen and everyone is the guest of Rabia that day. And Abu Bakr and Abu Sahaba come and he's eating. And, and this is his wedding feast. And he doesn't own anything else. So the Prophet says, you know that piece of land that I own? Yeah, it's yours now. And Abu Bakr over his Abu Bakr says, I'm going to give you half my land as well. So now, not, now he's not only uh, married, he's also now a landowner. And he tells an interesting story. He said, later on in life, he said, because Abu Bakr gave me half of his land, we were neighbors. He said, later on, there was a dispute between me and Abu Bakr over a tree that grew right there in the middle. Like, who's going to get it? So he said, I argued over it. He said, like he said, I argued over it, 
wait, I can write this history and it's free. So no, I mean, think about it. A couple of years ago, it's a, a woman who gave him that land. But he says, uh, when Allah gave me dunya and things got better for me, he argues over it and Allah said a statement to me that hurt me. Yeah, he said to me something that was hurtful. And um, he said, I, I said to him, I'm never going to forgive you. You called me that statement, I'm never going to forgive you. Allah said, listen, I said, oh, I'm there. you have to forgive me. I'm not going to forgive you. And he says, if you don't forgive me, I'm going to tell the Prophet. <laughs> and think about it. Again, it shows you the human nature of the Sahaba, right? And then when he says, you got to do what you got to do. And then some of his cousins and family members say, listen, did he insult you? And now he's going to the Prophet. Don't worry, you're back here. Let's go to the Prophet. And then the Rabbi said, he hit me. He said, you know, guys, don't come with me. He said, why? He said, that's our work. Of the Prophet. If Abu Bakr is upset, the Prophet's going to get upset. Because the Prophet loves Abu Bakr more than anyone else. And if the Prophet gets upset, Allah is going to get angry at us and we'll all be destroyed. So let me handle this. He said, he chased Abu Bakr down, but it's too late. They arrive at the Prophet. Abu Bakr tells him what happened, and then Rabia says, it's quiet. And then Rabia, the Prophet says, yeah, Rabia, is this true? And he said, yes. And Rabia mentioned this because it's a point of view story. He's narrating the story. He says, I was surprised how Abu Bakr did not leave out any detail and mentioned everything exactly how it happened. And then he said, um, oh, Ya Rasulullah, what should I do? He said, you need to say, oh Allah, forgive Abu Bakr, and you need to take this wrong. And he said, I said, oh Allah, forgive Abu Bakr, and he let it go. And he said, I looked at Abu Bakr and he was crying. That one statement hurt him so bad because he was worried that it would affect him. And he, he felt so bad about it that he said, then I realized how much piety this man had. It shows you that they were human beings, but it also shows you how pious they were. Now, who was I talking about all this? Who, who's the one that's getting married, that's disputing that Abu Bakr is happening to you? It's the same person who said to the Prophet, when he said to him, ask me anything, I want to be with you in Jannah, and the Prophet says to him, do what I want to do. There's a point I'm trying to make, whether it's Abu Bakr or Rabia, or whether it's any of the other companions that he mentioned. They live this life getting ready for the next one. And they wanted Jannah, and they wanted to relax in Jannah. They wanted to see Allah, they wanted Allah to be pleased with him. They wanted to be able to visit the Prophet, to enjoy a life after death that is eternal. There's a lot to describe in Jannah. It's beauty, it's castles, it's palaces, it's people. Uh, and we can talk about it a lot. But remember this, it is a place prepared for those who are pious and righteous. May Allah make us among those. I'm going to conclude there, inshallah uh, ta'ala. Thank you for having me. I hope it was, well, I hope it was interesting. Uh, Barakatikum, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.